Welcome everybody. It seems that most people are now in our Zoom room. So welcome to the Public Health Agency of Canada webinar for healthcare providers, allergies and anaphylaxis and low dead volume syringes discussion. My name is Margaret Harris Brockman and I'm with the National Collaborating Centre for Infectious Diseases. NCCID is funded by the Public Health Agency of Canada to provide knowledge and evidence for use in public health planning and policy. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge that NCCID is located on the original lands of the Anishinaabe, Cree, OG Cree, Dakota, and Dene peoples, and on the homeland of the Métis Nation. We respect the treaties that were made on these territories, we acknowledge the harms and mistakes of the past, and we dedicate ourselves to move forward in partnership with Indigenous communities in a spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. There are a few housekeeping items I would like to mention. We are running this webinar through Zoom, and you can find the link in the email you received from Eventbrite. If you have any technical problems with Zoom, please email us at nccid at umanitoba.ca, and we will do our best to assist you. Following each of the two presentations, there will be a short question and answer session. Please use the Q&A tab in Zoom to pose your questions to our speakers, but we ask that you hold off until near the end of the presentation. The, the tab will be open, um, but wait until the end, as I say, as there may be some things that are answered during the presentation. Note that we will not be able to answer all questions, but we'll do our best. You can, during the Q&A session, like other people's questions, which pushes them up in priority. Speakers will not be answering in writing and attendees will not be able to respond to all, as I mentioned. The chat tab has been disabled, but we will post a few important messages for all of you to see during the web presentation. The event is live and it is being recorded and the presentation and the recording will be available on the NCCID website after this webinar. I would now like to invite our moderator, Dr. April Killikelly, and speakers, Dr. Bryna Warshavsky and Dr. Catherine Dixon to unmute themselves and turn their cameras on as we begin the webinar. And I will ask all other panelists to concurrently, uh, who are not speaking to hide their cameras. Thank you. Thank you, Margaret, and welcome everyone today. We're very excited to have you. Um, as you may know, this webinar is in two parts. And today we're starting with, with the first part on al allergies and anaphylaxis, sorry. Uh, I want to introduce Drs. Bryna Ryszowski and Catherine Dixon, who are medical advisors at the Public Health Agency of Canada. They'll be doing a presentation, as well as um, Jocelyn Zafak and Alyssa Abrams. I will be joining for the Q&A panel. Uh, Jocelyn is a senior epidemiology, uh, epidemiologist with the Public Health Agency of Canada, and Dr. Alyssa Abrams is a pediatric allergist who works with the University of Manitoba and the University of British Columbia. So over to you, Bryna and Catherine. Great, uh, thanks very much, April, and welcome everyone. Um, Catherine, if we could just get the next slide, please. So um, just to start off that um, myself, Catherine and Jocelyn have no conflict of interest to declare. And um, the objective of our slide, of our presentation today is on the next slide. And um, we're going to go over today, Canada's vaccine safety system. And Catherine will do that for us. And then we're gonna describe allergy related contraindications and precautions as outlined by the National Advisory Committee on Immunization and then talk about some of the key features and management of some of the things that can happen after a vaccine has been administered. Uh, these are generally rare, but um, help in the preparation for those things in case they should happen. So our outline is on the next slide. As mentioned, we're going to do an overview of um, the safety monitoring infrastructure in Canada, then talk about anaphylaxis in a bit more detail, talk about the definitions of anaphylaxis and the mechanism by which anaphylaxis occurs. Then uh, Catherine will speak about the um, mRNA anaphylactic reactions that have been reported in Canada. And then I will speak about the experience with uh, the mRNA vaccines and anaphylaxis in the United States. Then discuss some of the possible allergens in the mRNA COVID-19 vaccines. Talk about the questions and screening for um, allergy and allergic reactions when administering the mRNA vaccines and some of the management of the responses to those questions. And then go into the 
details of managing both anaphylaxis and fainting and also local hives, which are some of the things that can occur after administering um, a COVID-19 vaccine or other vaccines as well. So I'll now turn it over to Catherine and she will go over uh, some of the uh, safety infrastructure that we have in Canada, as well as the definitions and um, mechanism of ac action for anaphylaxis. Over to you, Catherine. Thanks, Bryna. Um, so just as an overview of our vaccine safety system, um, health products like vaccines are fully reviewed before they are approved for um, use in Canada. And then for vaccines following this, this approval, um, we have several systems in place to ensure that we are receiving and collecting and able to act on any information on um, any of it. And, any events or unexpected trends that we see with how these vaccines are behaving in the field. Um, and as I mentioned, Canada has a well-established vaccine safety program um, that helps to rapidly detect and respond to these signals. Um, this program is in uh, developed in collabor and um, acted on in collaboration with partners in Health Canada, the Public Health Agency of Canada, the provinces and territories, as well as manufacturers. In addition to monitoring safety, which um, is today's focus, um, we also have monitoring systems in place to monitor vaccine effectiveness, so how well vaccines are working, as well as coverage, so how what proportion of our population have been vaccinated, um, as well as gathering information about those who are, are not vaccinated to understand potentially why or where there might be some hesitancy. Um, so in terms of vaccine monitoring in Canada, um, we receive, we at the Public Health Agency of Canada through public health systems in the provinces and territories, as well as our colleagues at Health Canada through the vaccine manufacturers receive uh, reports of AFIs or adverse events following immunization. So these are un any unfavorable or unintended medical occurrence um, reported following immunization that may or may not be caused by the vaccine, but is related in terms of timing. Um, reports of AFIs are expected during any vaccine campaign, especially with any new product um, where certainly we're um, trying to keep a close eye. And I think also people who are reporting AFIs are more likely to report events that, um, that, that they, they receive notification about that they're, they might be concerned about. Um, so these AFIs can either be events that we of a type that are already known of through early earlier clinical trials, or can be new types of events or signals that have not not been reported, and um, can range from non-serious events. So these could be things such as um, rash. At, at the around the site of immunization, swelling, muscle aches, a mild headache, to um, and these are the majority of the reports that we receive to um, more severe cases, which are are quite rare that we receive very small numbers of these reports. But these can be um, events that require hospitalization or um, or hospital admission. And it's important to be able to respond to these events of concern, um, as well as to be able to build and maintain public um, confidence in vaccination. So a quick um, return to our um, university or, or medical training days um, to look at the mechanisms of anaphylaxis. So um, what we really wanted to highlight here is that there are, are two main pathways to which um, allergy responses or anaphylaxis responses get triggered. You have your IgE mediated pathway in um, which the body responds to a new antigen by um, the B cells producing specific IgE antibodies that will bind to the mast cells and basophils. This is silent at your first exposure to a, um, an antigen, but then allows for a 
greater response during the future exposures where you will have um, cross links of the um, allergens to the, the IgE receptors and um, mast cell deranulation. And then in addition to this IgE mediated allergic response, we have non IgE mediated response um, listed here as allergic non allergic mechanisms, but non IgE mediated would be probably the more technically appropriate term. And this is um, general mast cell um, activation by non specific agents. Um, such as histamine related and um, can cause immediate hypersensitivity, which will also lead to mast cell um, degranulation. In terms of what anaphylaxis looks like, so this is um, fortunately an extremely rare, severe, um, life-threatening allergic reaction, which is rapid onset, progresses very rapidly and has multiple body systems involved. Um, so this uh, anaphylaxis can include, but is, does not exclusively include symptoms such as generalized urticaria or hives, um, wheezing, swelling in the mouth, tongue, or throat, difficulty breathing, vomiting, diarrhea, hypotension, a decreased level of consciousness or shock. Um, this table here can be found in the anaphylaxis and other acute reactions following vaccination section in the Canadian Immunization Guide. When reviewing um, cases of potential anaphylaxis that get reported to the Public Agency of Canada through um, CAFIS, the Canadian Adverse Events Following Immunization and Surveillance System. Um, so these cases receive medical review at the agency level, as well as these are cases that are reported through public health. So we'll also um, get reviewed at the local level by um, local or regional or um, medical health officers. Um, and what we do at the agency level is we use the um, Brighton Collaboration case definition for anaphylaxis to, um, to determine the likelihood that this is an actual anaphylaxis case. So this depends on the case meeting um, criteria from two or more body systems um, and are assessed to determine whether they meet either major or minor criteria. This is something that um, if you are reporting on cases from of anaphylaxis that you see getting details about um, whether uh, swelling is actually seen versus the person is complaining about swelling would be extremely helpful for us on this side for being able to help us determine whether we should be counting this as a case of anaphylaxis. Um, this slide shows based on the number of major or minor Brighton criteria that a case meets, whether we, how we classify um, them. So in our system, cases that meet either levels one to three of the Brighton um, case definition for anaphylaxis, um, so have at least a minor respiratory or a minor cardiovascular and one other um, minor system involved um, would be considered as level three. These are considered as anaphylaxis. Cases that are either level four, so these are cases where there's just not enough information for us to be able to, to determine whether they meet um, more than two minor, minor or major criteria in two body systems, or our uh, level five is a case that we can determine does not meet the definition for anaphylaxis. These are considered in our system as not cases of anaphylaxis. Obviously at the, the front line um, in managing a case clinically, um, the Brighton criteria are likely less um, relevant in terms of what you, you are doing in terms of responding on the spot. And just sharing some early data that we've um, received from CAFIS. This is information up to January 28th of this year. We had received 45 AFI reports of anaphylaxis um, um, out of uh, 
over 900,000 doses of mRNA vaccine administered. So that represents a reporting rate of almost five cases per 100,000 doses administered, um, which is on the higher side than what we would expect for a vaccine. Um, We've provided our background rate for anaphylaxis in Canada. So this is based on emergency room visits and hospitalizations, where we expect in a year to see 8.4 um, cases per 100,000 individuals. And with this, I will pass the mic back over to Bryna. Great, uh, thanks very much, Catherine. Um, so now we're just going to switch gears a little bit and talk about um, some other anaphylactic um, experiences um, outside of Canada. So as you know, in the clinical trials, there was very little anaphylaxis reported. Um, if you dig into the FDA um, data, you'll find one report of anaphylaxis for the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine, and there were no reports for the Moderna vaccine. Um, the U.S. has been monitoring their um, their rates of anaphylaxis, and to date, um, they have, um, well, to date, as of um, January 18th, they've been administering vaccine between December 14th and January 18th. They've administered 10 million doses in that time period and have reported 50 cases of anaphylaxis. So that comes to a rate of five cases of anaphylaxis per million doses administered. Now, in their, um, their data, they have... Um, indicated the interval between the vaccination and the onset of symptoms. And they've noted that 74% of the cases, so the majority of the cases, developed their anaphylaxis within 15 minutes of vaccination. A few cases are reported within 15 to 30 minutes of vaccination, and then even fewer with uh, beyond the 30 minutes uh, from vaccination. Interestingly, uh, quite a few of the people that the uh, experience this anaphylactic reaction, have um, a history of allergies, 80% report a history of allergies, and about a quarter report a history of a previous anaphylactic reaction. From a smaller subset, the original um, subset of patients that were reported, there were um, 21 patients in a smaller subset, and there in that smaller subset, we know their outcomes after follow-up, and we know that after being sent to the hospital, about 20% of them were hospitalized and the remaining 80% were sent home. And of the ones that we know, they have had um, good outcomes. So I should just note that originally when the, the United States first reported their rates of anaphylaxis, they were reporting 11.1 doses per million based on their first two weeks of experience. But in additional follow-up, it's fallen to five per million uh, doses administered. So more than we would usually see for um, vaccine-related anaphylaxis, which is about one uh, case of anaphylaxis per uh, million doses. This is averaging about five, but um, clearly not hugely elevated um, at this point um, based on the information from the United States for the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine. The next slide will show you the experience for the Moderna vaccine. We can just switch to that. Um, so the Moderna vaccine, there were no reports of anaphylaxis in the clinical trials. They've, in the United States, been administering that vaccine from December 21st, and there's data up into January 18th. So far, they've administered in that period 7.6 million doses and have experienced 21 cases of anaphylaxis. So this comes out to a rate of 2.8 million cases of anaphylaxis per million doses administered. So a bit lower than the, uh, the Pfizer-BioNTech, but in the same range. Um, the interval between vaccination and onset of symptoms um, here again was mostly within the first 15 minutes. So almost everybody within the first 15 minutes, just a few cases uh, between uh, one case, I think between 15 and 30 minutes and two cases um, at longer than 30 minutes. And again, the same uh, pattern, interestingly, that most of the people who experience anaphylaxis have a history of allergy and a quarter have a history of an anaphylactic reaction in the past uh, to, some, to something. In follow-up, again, we only have a follow-up on a smaller subset of 10 patients. And here, 60% um, were hospitalized, um, a number admitted to the ICU, so fairly um, significant um, reactions that required ICU or um, in a small number of intubation as well. And um, the rest were just seen in the emergency department. Of the ones that they have known outcomes, 
all have recovered. So again, indicating that um, anaphylaxis can be a serious event resulting in a potentially ICU admission, but is very rare and the outcomes are, have been good so far. So if we can just switch to the next slide, we're going to now talk about the components of the uh, COVID-19 vaccines um, and then speak about the potential allergens. So at the top, you can see the, uh, the main component of both the, um, of the mRNA COVID-19 vaccines. Uh, and on the left, you'll see the components of the um, Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine and on the right, Moderna. So the first component in both vaccines is the mRNA itself, which is the active ingredient. This, as you know, is the genetic code for the spike protein. It's uh, carried into the cell, into the cytoplasm. The spike protein is manufactured from the genetic code using the cell's machinery. And then the spike protein is displayed on the surface of the cell and our body makes an immune response, both to antibody and T cell response to that spike protein. So that's listed um, at the top of the slide. The next four ingredients are listed under the line in both the Pfizer BioNTech and the Moderna vaccines are the components of the lipid nanoparticle. So as you know, the lipid nanoparticle is the carrier that brings the mRNA uh, into the cells and then releases the mRNA into the cells so that the genetic code can be uh, made into the protein. In both vaccines, the lipid nanoparticle consists of four components. So basically it's a, a lipid bilayer and then um, it has cholesterol inserted into it to help with its stability. And then it has um, this polyethylene glycol added to the uh, to the lipid nanoparticle, and that polyethylene glycol helps to stabilize the nanoparticle and also prolongs the, uh, the lifespan of the nanoparticle. And so that polyethylene glycol is in both the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine and the Moderna vaccine. The rest of the ingredients that are listed under those four that form part of the lipid nanoparticle are um, basically salts or um, other ingredients that help maintain the pH, so the acidity, uh, acidic balance of the, um, the vaccine. And also you have in there sugar as well. And that sugar helps with the freeze thaw. So helps them in, in keeping the vaccine stable while it's being frozen and thawed and helps prevent the, the particles of the vaccine from sticking together. So um, when you look at this, there's, you, know, you wouldn't obviously see our common allergens. You don't see egg. There's no egg in this vaccine. Uh, there's no gelatin in this vaccine. And in the container, there's no latex in the vaccine. So at first blush, you, you don't obviously see that there are potential allergens in this vaccine. But um, very smart allergists have been um, looking through the literature and um, then shortly thereafter realized that there are some allergens in both vaccines. And on the next slide, you'll see those highlighted. Um, so in both vaccines is this polyethylene glycol that's attached to the lipid nanoparticle, and that is a known allergen. Um, as we'll talk about, it's a rare allergen. It doesn't occur um, that frequently to cause severe allergic reactions, but it is a known allergen. As well, in the Moderna, there's a, a, a chemical called tromethamine, which is also very rarely, when you review the literature, been associated with um, allergic reactions. And so we'll speak about that as well. So those are the two, uh, the polyethylene glycol and the tromethamine are the known allergens within the products. Uh, polyethylene glycol in both products and tromethamine only in the Moderna product. And again, re-emphasizing there's no egg, there's no gelatin, and there's no latex in the products. Okay, so if we tune to the next slide, here we'll speak um, a bit about polyethylene glycol. So as mentioned, this is a component of the lipid nanoparticle in both products, in the Pfizer BioNTech and the Moderna product. It's also a very common ingredient in many other things. It's most commonly found in um, osmotic laxatives and also in the oral bowel preparations that are used as you prepare for a colonoscopy procedure. That's the most common place to find polyethylene glycol but it's also found in a number of other ingredients. So you can find it in cough syrup, um, you can find it in skin medication, skin products and cosmetics, um, also in contact lens solution, in ultrasound gel, and it's an excipient, so sort of an inactive ingredient or a, a, and not the main ingredient in a number of medications. So it's in a number of things. However, um, it's very rare in terms of causing allergic reactions. 
So um, rarely IgE mediated allergic reactions have been reported. They would occur in people who, um, as Catherine explained, the mechanism of, anaph of anaphylaxis, people who have been exposed often to um, medications that contain the polyethylene glycol, they would have developed an IgE mediated response. And then on a subsequent exposure to a medication or a bowel prep or um, a laxative that contains polyethylene glycol, they could um, then subsequently develop an IgE mediated anaphylactic reaction. You can see though that how rare this is. So um, looking at PEG associated anaphylaxis related to the colonoscopy preparation medications or laxatives, only reported about four cases per year in the United States. So a very rare cause of allergy. And it, it would be quite unusual for people in our clinics to report this kind of allergy, but of course it can happen. Now we do know that polyethylene glycol is chemically related to polysorbates. And polysorbates are a very frequent um, chemical in a number of our vaccines. Uh, so polysorbate 80 particularly is found often in vaccines. They're, now, because they are chemically related, um, in theory, you can be allergic to PEG and also have allergies to polysorbate, or the reverse uh, can also happen. But this is very rare. And in the National Advisory Committee review of, um, of polyethylene glycol and polysorbate, they have not listed a contraindication to an MR of that A vaccine as being an allergy to polysorbate. So being allergic to polysorbate is not listed as a contraindication to an mRNA vaccine. To reiterate, M, uh, our mRNA vaccines do not contain polysorbates, they contain polyethylene glycol, but because of this um, potential relationship between them in the United States, they have listed polysorbates as a, um, a contraindication to the mRNA vaccines. In Canada, because of the, you know, we're not as, um, the literature is not as strong, we've decided at this point not to list polysorbates as a contraindication to the mRNA vaccine. Okay, so on the next slide, um, we'll talk about the other allergen, and this is trimethamine. It has a number of other names, trimethamol or TRIF. Again, this is only a component of the Moderna vaccine. However, it's also found in a few other vaccines, which is um, the Activ vaccine, a haemophilus influenza type B vaccine, and Nymenrix, which is a meningococcal vaccine. We haven't previously listed um, trimethamine as an allergen in the Canadian Immunization Guide, but based on um, our research with the mRNA Moderna vaccine, this is something that will be relooked at. Now, trimethamine is found in, um, as in addition to vaccines, in a number of other products as well. It can commonly be found in contrast agents that are used for radiologic procedures, and also in a number of oral and parenteral uh, medications, also as an, um, an excipient um, in those medications. Now, it's a very rare cause of IgE-mediated reactions. In fact, um, in the literature, we found very few reports. However, there is one report which was fairly definitive to indicate that the trimethanol was the potential cause of allergy. This was a person who had um, a gadolinium-based contrast agent given as part of a, as a radiologic procedure and developed um, an allergic reaction. Now we know that gadolinium-based contract agents themselves can be a cause of allergic reactions, but when they were skin tested with a number of different um, uh, gadolinium-based contract agents, they didn't react to them all. They only reacted to the ones that contained the trimethamol. And then when subsequently tested with trimethamol, that was found to be an allergen. So this was fairly definitive evidence that it wasn't actually the contrast agent, but the trimethamol that was the um, the cause of the allergic reaction, and therefore we're listing trimethamol as a potential um, allergen in the Moderna vaccine. However, um, so you know, one of the things to note is it's very easy if somebody has an allergy to trimethamol, as rare as that would be, because it's not a, vac a component of the um, Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine, you can use that vaccine with someone who has a trimethamol allergy. Okay, uh, next slide please, Catherine, thanks. So now we're going to switch to talking about um, how NASI, the National Advisory Committee on Immunization, has recommended screening patients with regard to potential allergies. 
So what they have listed is that a severe allergic reaction, so anaphylaxis, to a previous dose of either of the mRNA vaccines, so either the Pfizer-BioNTech um, vaccine or the Moderna vaccine, is a contraindication to the second dose of the vaccine. Um, so that's just something uh, to keep in mind that if you've had an allergic reaction to a previous dose, you can't get the second dose. Um, and that's a severe allergic reaction like anaphylaxis. As well, if you're known to have a previous um, severe allergic reaction to a component of the vaccine, and in this case, we're talking about either the um, tromethamine um, or the polyethylene glycol, you shouldn't get a vaccine that contains that component. So if you've had a severe allergic reaction to the uh, polyethylene glycol, which again is very rare, then you wouldn't be able to get either of the mRNA vaccines. If you've had a severe allergic reaction to tromethamine, then you wouldn't get the a Moderna vaccine, but you would be eligible for the Pfizer vaccine because it doesn't contain that component. Okay, uh, next slide, please. NASA then goes on. Oops, I think we might have uh, missed one. Just back one. Yeah, that's great. Thanks. Um, so NASA then goes on to speak about how to manage people who have had mild to moderate reactions to a previous dose of the mRNA vaccine. So not an anaphylactic reaction, but another allergic type reaction. And here what they're recommending is that um, these people be assessed by a physician or nurse uh, with expertise in immunization. And the decision can be made at that point whether to vaccinate the person again or whether to refer them on for an aller uh, to an allergist or an immunologist or someone with expertise in allergy to decide whether they should be receiving another dose of vaccine. Now here, this requires some judgment, obviously, and it's hard in guidance to, to be very totally specific. Um, here's where the clinician is going to have to, you know, make some decisions. So if somebody had a reaction that, you, you know, really on assessing, you don't really think it's an allergic reaction or it was very mild, like a high that, you know, went away very quickly, then the clinician may feel comfortable just to re-immunize um, without a, um, a referral. However, if the patient had like respiratory symptoms or developed angioedema, so swelling, especially around the face or in other parts of the body, then the clinician may not feel comfortable re-immunizing in those conditions and may feel that um, a referral to an allergist or someone with expertise in allergy um, is, is recommended. In any case, if someone's had um, a mild to moderate allergic reaction to um, a previous dose and the decision is made to re-immunize, then they, people require at least a 30-minute um, observation period in the immunization clinic. Now, as an extra precaution, if um, someone has had a proven severe allergic reaction to not an mRNA vaccine or not any components of the mRNA vaccine, but to another vaccine, or any injectable medications. Nathie said that this isn't a contraindication. These people can be vaccinated, but is recommending that these people be observed for 30 minutes um, post-vaccination, just to be sure that everything's okay. Um, on the next slide, we'll just speak about um, the remaining individuals. So um, here, Nathie is saying that if someone has had um, an allergic reaction, but it's not to an mRNA vaccine, and it's not to any of the components of the mRNA vaccine, and it's not to a previous vaccine or other injectable therapy, if something like to food or to um, oral drugs or um, insects or environmental allergies, then they can be vaccinated as per usual recommendations with a 15-minute observation period post-vaccination. Now, I do want to stress again here that these are guidance and they don't replace clinical judgment. So if in your clinical judgment you're seeing someone and you're worried about a past allergic reaction, then it's really up to you how long you decide to keep someone under observation in the clinic. Obviously, in the context of COVID-19, we're trying to minimize the times that people wait post um, immunization in a common area because of the risk of COVID transmission. Um, we want people to wait as far apart as possible in the waiting area and be wearing a mask. But if you're concerned about an allergic reaction for whatever reason based on the client's history, then keeping them that extra, you know, up to 30 minutes or, or as long as you feel is necessary will provide some extra reassurance. So you kind of are judging the and weighing the, um, the allergy concern versus the, um, the 
waiting and risk of transmission. But again, we're trying to prevent the risk of transmission by masking and pe keeping people um, physically distant from each other. So the 30 minute waiting period is definitely recommended if someone's had um, a reaction like um, to a mild or moderate reaction to to a previous mRNA vaccine and decided to give them the vaccine, then definitely a 30 minute um, observation period. Or if they've had an allergic reaction to um, another vaccine or an injectable uh, medication that has nothing to do with the mRNA vaccines, but um, just if they've had a past particularly severe reaction to a vaccine or injectable medication, then they should be observed for about 30 minutes. Um, again, observing those that physical distancing. The other very important piece of counseling is that when the person leaves the immunization clinic, they need to um, be advised that should they develop allergic reactions or any signs of anaphylaxis, that they need to seek medical attention right away. So most, as we know, anaphylactic reactions will occur within the first 15 to 30 minutes and mostly within the 15 minutes where clients will still be in the clinic. Um, but if it turns out that they are one of the rare people that develops um, an anaphylactic type reaction or allergic reaction when they leave the clinic, then they should be advised to seek medical care right away. If there's any respiratory symptoms or any uh, angioedema or, you know, progressive hives, then they should call 911 and be advised that this is, you know, the potential for the seriousness of the reaction and to immediately seek medical care. Okay, next slide, please, Catherine. Um, so this is just another way of summarizing some of the information and a little bit um, uh, in addition to some of NACI's guidance. And I should just uh, mention at this point that NACI's guidance is still under review. Um, we're, NACI is still considering all the, the, the potential ways that these reactions could be managed, um, trying to balance the concern about anaphylactic reactions and the, the risk of anaphylaxis with the importance of making sure that, that people are vaccinated, recognizing the severity of, um, of the COVID-19 infection and wanting to prevent illness and, um, and severe consequences from disease. So it's a, it's a balancing act. So here we're just looking at severe. Um, so this chart will help sort of just walk through what, what's been mentioned before, looking at severe or allergic reactions to a previous dose of um, the COVID-19 mRNA vaccines. If it's a severe allergic reaction, such as anaphylaxis, then that's a contraindication to another dose. Um, if it's a less severe allergic reaction, then that's a judgment um, by the healthcare provider, including whether this person should be referred for um, an allergic assessment. If it's decided that reimmunization should be done um, either by the original healthcare provider or on referral, then um, the recommendation is to observe the client for 30 minutes after vaccination. If the person is known to be um, allergic to polyethylene glycol, in, which is in both vaccines, if it's a severe anaphylactic reaction, then that is a, a contraindication to an mRNA vaccine. If it's a less severe reaction, now this is not uh, covered per se in the um, in the guidance, but if it's a less severe reaction uh, to polyethylene glycol, so a known aller allergy to polyethylene glycol, but it wasn't an anaphylactic type reaction, here again, it's a judgment call by the healthcare provider and a referral to a specialist uh, may be indicated to uh, decide on the appropriateness of vaccination. And here again, a 30 minute observation period should vaccination uh, be felt to be safe to proceed. If someone has had an allergic reaction to tromethamine or tromethamol or the other words for, um, for that product, then um, it's simple because that's only in the Moderna vaccine. So these people can be offered the Pfizer um, BioNTech vaccine. As mentioned before, a past allergic reaction to not the mRNA vaccine, not the components of the mRNA vaccine, but any other vaccine or injectable, so it's like particularly a severe allergic reaction, um, but, but any known allergic reaction as well, you, uh, the recommendation is that these people can be vaccinated with an mRNA vaccine, but just the extra bit of precaution uh, to observe them for 30 minutes instead of the, uh, the usual 15 minutes. And if they're not allergic to anything that's been listed above and they don't meet any of those criteria, but they you know, have some food allergy or environmental allergy, then it's the usual um, observation period for 30 minutes. Again, recognizing though that there is always some judgment here um, for, for the clinicians beyond what's recommended in these guidelines. Okay, um, so the next slide please. Now we're going to talk about um, some of the reactions that may we may see after um, administering a vaccine. 
So we're talking a lot about anaphylaxis and we will talk about that in more detail. But in fact, the most common thing that we'll see after um, in, an immunization is a vasovagal or fainting episode. We might also see some anxiety symptoms such as breath holding or hyperventilation, but the, the most common thing that will occur or can occur after vaccination is a fainting episode. So I'll just go through um, some of the clinical features of anaphylaxis and fainting to help distinguish those. So with anaphylaxis, as we've discussed, it usually starts within the first 15 minutes, can be 30 minutes, can be even up to a few hours after the injection. And it can affect a number of different um, organ systems. So as Catherine mentioned, we can see hives, we can see angioedema, so swelling of the, the mouth or, um, or the tongue or um, other parts of the body. We can see generalized itching or redness of the skin. We can have respiratory symptoms as well. So cough, wheezing, strider, so noisy breathing, respiratory distress, which of course is a very serious consequence, or more mild, so runny nose or sneezing, which will also, also be symptoms, could be symptoms of anaphylaxis. Um, tachycardia, increased heart rate, and then of course people feeling anxious because they are not feeling well, and then um, subsequently, which can result because of um, bronchoconstriction, can loss of um, loss of oxygenation, and then um, ending up passing out and, and falling down. So those are the anaphylactic symptoms. The vasovagal symptoms, the fainting symptoms, um, as we mentioned, are more common. These can happen sometimes even before vaccination. They can happen during the vaccination process and um, can frequently happen um, when they're going to happen after the vaccine. So someone's had their vaccine, they stand up after that process and they, they faint after that or can sometimes happen in the waiting area as well. These people will generally feel, um, they can look pale, they can have cold, clammy skin. Uh, their breathing will be generally be normal, although they can you know, have, some, be, have some anxious sort of symptoms. They may have bradycardia, uh, they feel lightheaded, and then they um, subsequently fall down and, um, and faint. It's not uncommon during fainting to see some clonic um, sort of seizure-like activities. These are very transient um, and are not a sign of someone having a seizure. They're just a consequence of the sort of lack of oxygenation for a few minutes, a few seconds while the person is recovering from their fainting episode. Uh, so don't be alarmed. If someone faints and you see a bit of eye rolling or, or these sort of seizure-like activities, it's a, no, a normal known um, reaction to fainting. Okay, so on the next slide, um, we'll just talk a little bit more about fainting because that is what um, you're most likely to see in a vaccination clinic. Um, the cause of fainting is someone feeling anxious or stressed or maybe pain leads to this uh, vasovagal response where there's low, uh, low pulse and low blood pressure, which results in not enough oxygen getting to the brain. And our brains don't like that. So the response to that is to put us on the floor to help the blood flow return to our brain. So basically people pass out and in the process of passing out, fall down and blood returns to the brain and people respond within a few minutes of a faint. The important thing for us is to try to make sure that if that happens, uh, first of all, we try to prevent it. And second of all, we try to prevent any injury should that happen, because we don't want people hitting their head and having um, brain injuries or losing teeth or breaking bones. Um, that, that's a, you know, not a good consequence of a, a vaccination, obviously. So in terms of trying to prevent fainting, the first thing to do is to ask about past fainting episodes. So if someone says they, you ask um, when you're seeking informed consent, have they fainted in the past with the vaccine or medical procedure? That's a sign that they may be prone to fainting. And you also want to watch them. So you want to see, are they looking anxious? Are they pale? Are they sweaty? Are they you know, just quite nervous? Those may be signs that these people may be prone to fainting. And if you suspect that someone may be prone to fainting, the best thing to do is to vaccinate them lying down. If you do that, it'll help prevent the faint, and it will also help prevent, even if they do faint, will help prevent um, any injury because they're already on the ground and they're not going to fall and hit anything. Um, so it's really important to screen for um, people who might faint and to manage them by vaccinating lying down. If they, they do faint, then um, the, uh, the response to that is to, they will already be lying down or you'll ease them to the ground. Um, Turn them on their side if they are looking like they're going to vomit or if they're, they're pregnant. And then the, the main thing to do is to raise their legs. If you can raise their legs, you'll help increase, increase the blood flow back to their brain, which will help um, them come out of the faint. And it usually doesn't take very long for uh, people to come out of the uh, fainting episode. 
then you really want to continue to monitor them closely. It'll take a bit till they feel totally back to themselves. So you kind of want to keep them under observation, make sure they're recovering. Once they're not feeling nauseous, you can offer them some sweet juice or some sweet food to eat to help them to feel a bit better. And you really don't want them to stand up um, until they're, you're really sure that they are feeling better. Then you want to get them to a chair, keep them there for a while to make sure that they are um, still feeling fine. And then eventually you let them um, leave from the clinic. And in our clinics, um, in the past, we've not rec- we've not um, allowed these people to drive home. We ask that someone else drive them home. Someone who's just recovered from a faint, you probably don't want them um, on the road um, until they're you know they're home and have had a chance to fully recover. Um, just to, to point out that the biggest probably risk period for the fainting episode is after you finish the vaccine, and you know you're doing your paperwork, and the patient gets up grabs their their clothes and gets ready to go to the waiting area in that standing up period is where they may faint so you really want to watch people closely if they look like they want to faint it might faint you want to hang on to them and you know ease them to the ground kind of thing so watch that period um, particularly for fainting okay so we'll switch now um in the next slide uh we're going to switch now to talking about anaphylaxis so as we mentioned, anaphylaxis is a very rare occurrence, um, but the key is to be prepared for anaphylaxis. So um, in terms of being prepared, prepared um, that's about a lot about training and um, in-servicing and protocols are all part of um, preparing for anaphylaxis. Um, so the other main piece of preparing is to have the appropriate equipment. And the appropriate equipment involves having an anaphylaxis kit. So with us, that used to be a, a bag that we put all these equipment in. And the contents of the anaphylaxis kit are listed in the Canadian Immunization Guide. So what you see here is taken from the Immunization Guide. We recommend having at least two, and some people I've heard um, say three anaphylaxis kits per clinic. And you want to make sure that that anaphylactic kit is always in the same place so you know exactly where to find it in your clinic, having at least one of them in your first aid area. That's where for sure you want one and then you decide where your other ones are, but just make sure that everyone knows where that location is. So one of the components of the anaphylaxis kit is to have a very clear set of instructions, so a laminated instruction sheet that you can easily grab that goes through the step-by-step instructions on how to manage anaphylaxis, which we'll go through in a minute. Um, and on the back of that, so the instructions on one side, and on the back you have the, um, the dosage chart for epinephrine. And this is a chart that you can find in the Canadian Immunization Guide, um, and it just lists the, um, the patient's age and weight and the recommended dose of epinephrine by age and weight. Um, it's preferable to, to give um, epinephrine based on weight, but we often don't have weight in an immunization clinic, so you often have to go on age. So having both of those dosages handy, um, as per the Canadian Immunization Guide, is on that laminated card. Of course, the, 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 the key thing to have in your anaphylactic kit is the epinephrine. It's the, uh, the key to managing um, anaphylactic reactions. So here we recommend that there be three vials of epinephrine in um, a one milligram per mil concentration um, that's available in the kit. You can also, if you want to have um, auto injectors for um, epinephrine, but it's easier to have the vials um, because you can adjust the doses more, um, more in a more refined way. Other supplies that are in your anaphylactic uh, kit are um, listed here, um, which includes, of course, needles and syringes for injecting the epinephrine, and then um, some other um, equipment listed here, um, particularly noting scissors. This is because we want to give the, um, the epinephrine in the thigh if um, that's the preferred location for giving epinephrine, and you may have to cut some clothing to do that. Then other things to monitor pulse and blood pressure and, um, and other equipment, including obviously having a, a phone available because you want to, um, to be able to call 911 as soon as possible or your medical services. And there on the right side um, is some optional um, equipment that is listed here, including the auto injectors, and um, which can be in addition to the, the um, vials of epinephrine and um, some other um, equipment, which are more refined that may be possible depending on your clinic location, but are not um, possible in some clinic locations. So they are optional items. Okay, on the next slide, um, we have the steps to go through uh, for managing anaphylaxis. And this again is taken from the Canadian Immunization Guide. The first 
step is to call 911 or any emergency medical services in your area. Next is to assess the patient. And so obviously you want it best to have two people, at least two people helping with the management of anaphylaxis. So one goes to call 911 while the other is managing uh, the client. Um, that, so the person managing the client will assess airway, breathing, circulation, uh, mental status, um, skin, try to assess body weight. But again, you may end up going by age. You want to place the person on their back um, and elevate their legs, just in case this is a faint as well. Um, but there are exceptions to that. If the person is not comfortable being laid on their back, if they're having any respiratory symptoms and they're more comfortable sitting up, then that's fine. Um, you manage that um, as per how they're comfortable. Obviously, if they're vomiting or if they're unconscious, you put them on their left side in case they do vomit and, or on their side. And if they're pregnant, it's on their, you put them on their left side. So then the important part is the administration of epinephrine. The dose is 0.01 milligrams per kilogram of body weight of the uh, one milligram per mil solution to a maximum of 0.5 milligrams. And again, this will be on your uh, dosage card. So you'll either do it by weight or by age and um, a maximum of uh, 0.5 milligrams. I am in the mid anterolateral thigh is the best location. The absorption of the epinephrine is fastest from the, that location. Um, you can repeat the epinephrine every five minutes if you need it, but usually patients improve with only one or two doses. And hopefully by the time you get to your second dose, your emergency medical personnel have arrived on the scene. You also uh, want to record everything that you've done. You want to keep track of the times, particularly that you've administered the doses of epinephrine and on any vital signs that you're taking. And then, um, you, of course, keep the patient stable and monitor them. And then uh, by then, your emergency medical services will be there um, and can take over management and transportation to uh, a hospital. It's very important that if someone has had epinephrine and um, been managed with anaphylaxis, that they be taken to a hospital because we do know that there can be a biphasic response to anaphylaxis. So people can um, have um, a reaction, but be given epinephrine, recover, and then the allergic anaphylactic type symptoms can recur because of course the, the allergen is still potentially in their system. So they need um, to be transported to the hospital and, um, and managed there. Um, other things to report, uh, to, to consider after an anaphylaxis is to report that event. Um, so to make sure that your adverse event uh, monitoring systems know about this event and fill out the AC form and report it um, as per your um, local or provincial uh, jurisdictions requirements. Of course, these people will not be eligible for another vaccine. So if this is their first vaccine, they won't be able to get their second vaccine because this is uh, now a contraindication to that. And um, as well, what we often did, and I'm sure this is done in other places as well, is if a patient gets transported to the hospital from a clinic, we would be sure to follow up with that patient to see the outcome and just to make sure that, that, they, um, that they've done well um, afterwards. Okay, so that's um, the management of anaphylaxis. We're just going to um, mention as well the management of hives at the injection site because this uh, can occur and um, doesn't necessarily need to be managed as anaphylaxis. It's, it's fairly common that you can see some you know, itchy bumps at the injection site. These may be an allergic type hive. It might just be a bit of a local reaction. So in the Canadian Immunization Guide, there is some, um, some standards for managing this. Basically, they say to um, observe the patient for at least 30 minutes to ensure that the hives remain localized. If you have some ice, you can put that on the injection site. If the hives disappear, and there's no other symptoms that develop. So, you know, no respiratory problems, no wheezing, no runny nose, no, no cough, nothing else develops. And the hives remain at the injection site um, after the 30 minutes and they sort of are resolving and you, there's no evidence of progression, then that person can, um, can be, you know, sent home um, once you're comfortable that everything is resolving and resolved. However, if they develop any other symptoms, so they, the hives either progress to the other parts of the body or they develop other symptoms in other systems like sneezing or runny nose, or even if they're mild, um, then they should be managed as per anaphylaxis. Okay, so on the next slide is uh, just, I believe, some conclusions um, and key messages. So basically, anaphylaxis following mRNA vaccines are, um, are a bit more frequent than with other vaccines, but still a very rare occurrence. So we shouldn't be immunizing, like worried all the time about anaphylactic reactions, but of course we need to be prepared for the management of anaphylactic reactions. 
As we know, they generally occur within 15 to 30 minutes, and this is why we keep people in the clinic for 15 minutes, one of the reasons, as well as management of fainting. Um, if you have concerns, particularly somebody who's had um, you know, potentially an allergic reaction to either an mRNA vaccine before and you decide to re-immunize, or if they've had um, an allergic reaction to a vaccine or other injectable medication before, then you want to keep them for that 30 minutes. We're not really sure of the cause of the um, the, the slight increases in allergic reactions to the mRNA vaccines that's being explored, whether that's um, the allergen or one of the other mechanisms that we've heard about for which you can get anaphylaxis. Nonetheless, screening patients for an allergen um, is important and for past um, reactions to the mRNA vaccines. So we do that. And um, we've gone over some of the management of, of um, people who have um, allergic reactions to mRNA vaccines before or um, the polyethylene glycol or the trimethamine. And just important to remember that anaphylaxis, it's rare, uh, but when it does occur, it is a medical emergency and really important just to be sure that, you know, um, the equipment is in place, the protocol is in place, and the training is in place um, for many people within your clinic so that they can manage this event should it occur. So finally, there's just some uh, key uh, resources and references. So the, um, the precautions and contraindications that we've mentioned are listed in the National Advisory Committee Statement on Immunization, which uh, can be found in this link. Um, in addition, the information that we've provided um, with regard to, on the next slide, the management of uh, anaphylaxis and other allergic reactions, those can be found in the Canadian Immunization Guide. Um, and as well, the Canadian Immunization Guide has a chapter on vaccine safety, which goes over the vaccine safety monitoring infrastructure uh, within our Canadian system. On the next slide as well, you'll find um, some information with regard to subscribing to um, receive updates from the NASI statements and the Canadian Immunization Guide. So um, if you're not subscribing, you can um, uh, sign up so that you can receive email notifications. And finally, there is um, on the next slide some additional resources on how to report adverse events following immunizations, as because as we've noted, um, allergic reactions and anaphylactic reactions are uh, reportable events, which should be reported um, through your um, local, provincial, and territorial um, systems. And um, just in closing, finally, before we open up to questions, just to acknowledge the Public Health Agency of Canada's Vaccine Safety Section, as well as the, uh, the National Advisory Committee on Immunization and the National Advisory Committee on Immunization's Vaccine Safety Working Group. Uh, so thank you very much for your attention, and I'll turn it back to you, April, to uh, moderate the Q&A. Great. Thank you so much, Bina and Catherine. That was really interesting. Um, so uh, we have a couple of questions, uh, lots of questions in the chat, which is not surprising. This is a really interesting topic. Uh, and um, I'll yeah, invite Catherine and Alyssa and Jocelyn to turn on their cameras and speak uh, whenever they, they feel uh, like they'd like to say something. So um, to the speakers, um, our first question is, are allergic but non-anaphylactic reactions considered contraindications for the second dose? So it's fine. I can start and then um, welcome uh, comments from others. Um, so allergic uh, non-anaphylactic reactions to the first dose, that was the question, right? Um, it are, um, are a bit of a, a gray area, right? So it, it really does require a judgment um, by the clinician. So you have to see, okay, are we sure this was an allergic reaction is the first kind of um, level of consideration. If it was an allergic reaction, then how comfortable are we with um, potentially re-immunizing? If it was like, you know, one hive that went away really quickly, then maybe, you know, we're comfortable with that. Or maybe we feel we want to, you know, go on for um, a more in-depth allergic re um, assessment. However, if it was more severe, like if there was any breathing difficulties or any angioedema or swelling, even if it doesn't meet the anaphylactic um, criteria and it wasn't managed as anaphylaxis, then that might be something where we would want an, uh, an allergist to, um, to weigh in uh, before re-immunizing with another dose. But I'm, um, and then if we do, of course, uh, decide to re-immunize, it's a 30-minute waiting period. Uh, but I'm very interested to hear what Alyssa has to say or, or Justin, if others would like to weigh in on that as well. Just unmute, Alyssa. Thank you. 
um, I'm happy to weigh in also. I would start by saying that anaphylaxis to this vaccine, even though it's higher, is historically still exceptionally low. So most reactions you see are likely not going to be systemic reactions. In general, I would say that if you're concerned that there has been an allergic reaction, and if the patient is concerned that there may have been an allergic reaction, it never hurts to involve an allergist or someone comfortable in the assessment of management of allergic reactions to help guide whether the vaccine could be administered in the future, how it could be administered and under what setting with what observation period thereafter. Okay, great. Maybe we'll move on to the next question. Um, is there any benefit to having a patient with a previous history of allergies take antihistamines prior to injection? I would start by saying no, but at least I'll, I'll uh, have you sure. answer that, please. I completely agree with you. In general, no. Once again, these are thought to be rare events. And in fact, antihistamines can mask skin symptoms of anaphylaxis, cutaneous symptoms, which we don't want to necessarily mask. So in general, I would say no. Some of the allergy guidelines have suggested that if there's been, in particular, very mild, delayed skin symptoms with the first vaccine, and the patient is more comfortable, you could consider a non-sedating antihistamine before the second dose, but I would say overwhelmingly, no, that isn't necessary. And April, if I just could jump in, that's something that I, I didn't mention, but, um, but possibly should have. When you review the Canadian Immunization Guide, it has actually changed, um, and you'll note that in the past, in the Canadian Immunization Guide, in the anaphylaxis kits, there was a recommendation to include um, diphenhydramine in, the, uh, in that kit, and, but that's no longer a recommendation in there. So we will not um, recommend having those in the kits and won't be part of the management of anaphylaxis because as uh, Lisa mentioned, it can mask the other symptoms and you don't want to do that. Okay, great. Um, Next question from the audience. Um, is a severe uh, allergy to pteridol, um and they put uh, catarolic teromethanine, I'm so sorry, <laughs> I'm not familiar, um, contraindications to Moderna. It, now, now, I'm sure I haven't nailed it. It is in the Q&A. Um, please help me with understanding uh, that question. So, no, Jocelyn, do you want to weigh in on that? Or? Yes, in fact, the product is a product that contains trometamine as part of the active ingredient. So well, I think in that case, we'll, you have to review with the patient history because the reaction could be to another ingredient. Like if the patient re reacted to the product, you are not sure if it's because of the trometamine or if it's because of another ingredient. And as we clearly mentioned, if you have, by asking if the patient has ever been in contact with other products containing trometamine, and did not react, that can be an indication that maybe the reaction to that product wasn't due to trometamine and you can give him the product. Or if you are worried, you can choose to give him the Pfizer biotech vaccine instead, which does not contain trometamine. Okay, great. Um, okay. When looking at reporting guidelines for AP, uh, the temporal criteria criteria are listed as inactivated vaccines and live attenuated vaccines. Moderna and Pfizer are mRNA vaccines. So which temporal criteria should we use? And the guess was inactivated. Okay. Catherine, do you want to weigh in on that? Well, I can start on that and then anyone- Oh, Justin, okay, go ahead. In. Sure. Yeah. Well, the thing is, as far as uh, anaphylaxis is concerned, they will usually occur within minutes whether it's a live or an inactivated, inactivated vaccine. So the temporal difference we usually make it's for other types of APs like fever and others, because usually with inactivated vaccines, the fever will occur within 48 hours following vaccination. Whereas for live vaccine, it would really behave like the real infection and you have a couple of days before having the fever. For example, for the MMR vaccine, who is a live vaccine, you expect the fever to occur within like five to 12 days after immunization. Whereas with the inactivated vaccine, you expect them with the, within the 48 hours. So that criteria, that temporal difference refers to other type of APHIS and do not really apply to anaphylaxis. 
Yeah, I, I agree with Jocelyn that um, for anaphylaxis, we're looking at a very short period that we're interested in reporting, um, but certainly for reporting of aphes in general, that's going to depend on um, the AFI. I, I think we do expect that the mRNA vaccines will um, act, will um, not will respond more um, like inactivated vaccines rather than than live and attenuated. Um, and but certainly if there's a temporal link, please report it um, just just to be on, on the safe side to make sure that we're um, keeping an eye on any anything unexpected that that might be going on related to the vaccine. Great, thank you for that. Um, okay, the next question is many people get Taxol as chemotherapy, which is highly uh, allergenic. Uh, the thought is that uh, cremophore, a uh, PEG, is the culprit. Is there um, those that have anaphylaxis to Taxol, should they get the mRNA vaccine? Well, I can start on that. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So as mentioned in the comment, when we are dealing with that product, that seems to be a high uh, probability that the person reacting to the product is actually allergic to PEG. I do not know the product specifically, so I guess if the likelihood in is increased for PEG is because maybe the other ingredients are not known as potential allergens. So you have to deal with your judgment call. So in that kind of situation where you they see higher suspicion of the patient being allergic to PEG, you can send the patient to an allergist first to complete the assessment before deciding if he should receive the mRNA vaccines or not. But given that the suspect here is PEG, which is contained in both vaccines, the assessment has to be completed before giving any, either of the mRNA vaccines. And if I, if I could just, just mention something as well, like we, in the, the NASA guidance, it doesn't, recommend screening for all the products that might contain PEG or trimethamine. As mentioned, those products are so common that they're in everything. So we're not asking people to say, you know, have you had a bowel prep um, for a colonoscopy and were you fine with that? So that's not the level of screening. These are people who, you know, obviously have had intense allergic reaction and investigations and would be the, the rare people that show up knowing that they've had these sort of reactions. So w it's not a screening protocol, a part of the protocol to have to go through to say, um, you know, have you had an allergy to anything that may contain PEG? But people may come up with these very specific situations. Um, and then in that case, guess, as Jocelyn mentioned, you need to use your judgment as to whether to proceed or to refer for an allergist assessment. Alyssa, do you want to add anything? Sure. I, I also sort of wanted to echo that PEG allergy historically is considered an exceptionally rare event, you know, largely limited to case reports and case series, maybe four cases a year um, historically over the past 10 or 12 years. So, and the PEG is in absolutely everything. It's rare that someone wouldn't have been exposed to PEG before. So I completely agree. This is not something necessarily to screen for. If there has been a reaction, absolutely an allergist is happy to evaluate that person, but it would likely be a rare occurrence. Okay, so understanding that a PEG allergy is very rare, there is a question about um, if a patient has a known allergy to one type of PEG, for example, um, 3350, um, would that person, person uh, be able to get this vaccine with a different PEG, PEG 2000? Justin? Or... <laughs> yes, <laughs> I will start on that. For that patient, he will need to be assessed by an allergist first. It is true that the more the, the when the molecular weight of the peg is, is high, the, re, the likelihood of an anaphylaxis is higher too. But meaning that with the peg 2000, which is who, who has which has a lower molecular weight, they might not be allergic to that. But you need to have the patient assessed before deciding if he should receive the vaccine or not. I see Alyssa nodding, so it seems like there's there's um, consensus there. Um, okay, should other inflammatory responses, for example, COVID arm, 
not sure what that is, but um, or inflamed colon be reported as adverse events, even though they're not, um, as they say, actual allergies. So I can um, start off with that one. So if others like April aren't um, familiar with the term COVID arm, this is a term that's been given in the media to a delayed um, localized reaction, usually seen following the Moderna vaccine. Um, the photos I've seen of it, it can be quite striking and um, anecdotally, it sounds like it's often um, assumed to be a cellulitis and treated like that, but it's an inflammatory reaction that will go away on its own. It also somewhat surprises people because it tends to occur several days after immunization. Um, so these, these probably shouldn't be reported as allergic events, but would be appropriate events to report as um, AFIs, depending on your sp um, particular provincial and territorial um, guidance as to what what to report up. But these these are um, events that certainly it would um, they're they're known, but it would be be good to to keep an eye on what's going on in the the general population. Great. And sorry, Brian, did you have a comment? No. Okay. Um, would a history of anaphylaxis be contraindicated contra to administration of COVID nineteen vaccines? Um. So I can start with that. So a history of anaphylaxis to um, only to the mRNA vaccine or to the polyethylene glycol would be contraindications for um, for the vaccine, um, or the trimethamine would be a contraindication for the uh, Moderna vaccine. But you could get the Pfizer vaccine um, if you'd had an, an anaphylactic reaction to a injectable vaccine or medication before. It's not a contra that doesn't contain mRNA or PEG it's not a PEG allergy or whatever, then um, the recommendation is to uh, be vaccinated, but to wait 30 minutes afterwards. Um, anaphylactic reactions to other things like bee stings or other um, environmental things are not contraindications. Um, the recommendation is a 30 minute, I mean, it's a 15 minute observation period, but clinicians can use some judgment there. And if they feel that they would like to observe for longer, that's also, um, you know, could be appropriate based on your clinical judgment. Alisa, Jocelyn, do you want to add anything? Sure, I can add, I just would add that, you know, allergic conditions are some of the most common chronic conditions of childhood and adulthood. These are super prevalent in the general population. And so even though we've seen that in the reports thus far, there were many people who had other allergies, other allergies are also very common in the general population. And we don't know how many people have very safely received the COVID vaccine with other allergies. And I completely agree, food allergies, other drug allergies, bee stings, even from the perspective of the Canadian Society of Allergy are not contraindications in any way. Great, thank you for that. Um, the next question is a bit technical. Um, so um, I think it may be for you, Alyssa. Um, can IgE be produced against non-protein antigens such as PEG? And in that case, wouldn't this likely be non-IgE mediated or perhaps non-specific cross-linkage of mast cell IgE similar to other drugs? And so that's a very interesting question. And this is an evolving discussion within our specialty. Anti-PEG IgE has been identified. And it actually has been identified that you may be able to test to it, although the testing to it remains highly controversial. Although I think from a broader perspective, whether it's IgE mediated or immunologic and non-IgE mediated or non-immunologic, anaphylaxis really is a clinical diagnosis based on signs and symptoms. And no matter what the pathophysiology, no matter why it's occurring, the treatment is the same, which is epinephrine. So it's a very interesting question, but ultimately from a practical perspective, you diagnose it based on signs and symptoms. And no matter what the underlying pathophysiology, the treatment will be exactly the same. Great, thank you. Um, okay, uh, so the next question is, residents uh, on high dose steroids and immunosuppressant drugs and chemo, should they not receive the vaccine? So, 
so it's funny. I think that 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 those are not necessarily allergy um, questions that relates to other parts of the National Advisory Committee on Immunization Guidance. And here, the National Immunization Committee has been saying that um, that these people may be vaccinated. It's just a discussion with their clinician about the risks and, and benefits of being vaccinated. Um, these are fairly new vaccines. Um, so we're, we're learning about them in terms of these conditions. They weren't, those conditions weren't included. The tr people with those conditions weren't included in the clinical trials. So, um, so there's not a lot of information about them. We know that their immune response may be lower because of those underlying medical conditions. However, they're also at risk for complications from infection. So um, it's that discussion with their, their clinician, but um, they can be safely vaccinated just with them, that sort of discussion and informed consent. Great, thank you. Um, that's that's really uh, great uh, context. Um, the next question is: Have individuals who have had an anaphylactic reaction um, have they developed immunity to the vaccine? Do we know? Yes, so I can start with that. I mean, oh sorry, go ahead, go ahead yeah. Jasmine. Oh, I was just going to say, like, I mean, the fact that they've had an anaphylactic reaction or not will not is, is irrelevant to their, their their response to the vaccine. We do know that after one dose of vaccine, we do see a fairly good um, response to the mRNA vaccines. Um, some some estimates have been as high as 92 percent or whatever. What we don't know about the one dose efficacy is how long it lasts. So, um, you know, as the studies have been based on two doses, so for now, you know, where everyone's getting a two dose schedule, but if you can't get the second dose because of an anaphylactic reaction, then um, you will quite likely have mounted um, a response to the first dose. We just don't know how long that, that response will last. I don't know, Justin, do you want to add anything additional? Or? No, no, no. That's exactly what I wanted okay. to see. Um, and then there is a question about um, fractional dosing for that second dose. Um, after an anaphylactic reaction. Um, I'm not sure if you had thoughts on that or um, if, if you, you, as, as you've, I've heard you say, um, that uh, after an anaphylactic reaction, you don't give the second dose. Well, I can start with that and Elisa or anyone else can comment more. So graded dose vaccination that in little bits have been used as it I don't know if I can call it desensitization method to administer the vaccine, even in patients who had an anaphylactic reaction to a previous dose. So it has been used with flu vaccines and other, and that's definitely something that can be considered for some of the patients, but you have to do that in a monitored context with an allergist immunologist, but that's definitely something you can do. And as I could just add, like, we don't know how splitting doses of, of these vaccines, because the technology is so different, what that will do in terms of an immune response. Um, so, yeah, that's something to consider as well. Great. Um, Okay, uh, sorry, I'm just reading the, the next question. I I'll, I'll, I'll think you've already answered this, but I'll, I'll just ask it just, just for completeness. Um, a Ministry of Health uh, document on special populations says those with allergy to previous injectable, IM, IV, et cetera, uh, should provide documentation to clinic uh, from a clinician saying that they have discussed the risks. Is this recommended or would a 30 minute observation period suffice? Jason, do you want to go or do you want? Um, so I can start if you want and then people jump in. So um, obviously different jurisdictions may have different guidance and you'll want to um, you know, be aware of your jurisdiction's guidance. The, the guidance as per the National Advisory Committee on Immunization has said that if you've had um, not to, like a reaction that's not to an mRNA vaccine and not to polyethylene glycol and not to the tromethamine, but just to like a past vaccine before or um, other injectable medication that it is fine to be um, immunized um, in the clinic setting, but just for a 30 minute observation period. Does that address the question, April? Or? 
Yeah, I think, do, Jocelyn, do you want to comment? No, no. No. I agree with what okay. Bernard was said. Okay. Um, there's another question about epinephrine. Um, someone is asking, um, they, they've seen an EpiPen used and the dose is 0.3 megs, but if one is using uh, AMP and the dose is 0.5 megs, can you explain the rationale for using the difference in dosing? Alisa, Jocelyn? So I can start. The epinephrine autoinjectors thus far in Canada, for the most part, only come in set formulations. The technical dosing for epinephrine is 0 0.01 milligrams per kilogram, up to 0.5 in adults. So I would go with that if you have the ampules. Um, if you have the epi epinephrine autoinjector available and that's more easily accessible for whatever reason, my inclination is that would likely be fine as well. But the technical dosing for treatment in a medical facility is 0 0.01 milligrams per kilogram. Great, thank you. Um, and just a quick clarifying question uh, for Bryna. Um, uh, it, it quotes you as saying, um, did Bryna say that new guidelines moving forward will recommend not having uh, Benadryl in anaphylaxis kits at all are uh, not to be part of anaphylaxis treatment at all. Yeah, yeah, that's correct. That's what we said. Then it's currently the currently posted guidance on the Canadian Immunization Guide um, no longer has rec um, reference to, to Benadryl. That's correct, right, Jocelyn? It's not there anymore. Yeah, okay, great. Um, the thing about Benadryl. Um, just from an allergy perspective, uh, Benadryl or diphenhydramine is sedating. It's one of the only antihistamines that is sedating. So on top of everything else, part of anaphylaxis can involve decreased level of consciousness. And if you use a sedating antihistamine, it can be very hard to figure out if anaphylaxis is progressing or if it's as a result of the sedating antihistamine. So if ever somebody is going to use an antihistamine in addition to anything else, we always recommend a non-sedating antihistamine, the second and third generation ones. And, and it's a fairly new removal from the Canadian Immunization Guide. For years, diphenhydramine was in that Canadian Immunization Guide, but it's no longer there. Um, uh, so that's a good point that about the sedating effect as well. Great, thank you. And I think we have time for one more question. Um, uh, and I think this is for Catherine. Um, are you able to comment a bit on the way adverse events are tracked nationally? What type of severity criteria beyond anaphylaxis do you use to serve as a signal to drill down to a side effect? So in terms of um, severity criteria, we'll be looking for um, events that what we consider as severe are events that have a um, emergency room or other you know, unplanned medical visit. Um, events that lead to hospitalization or um, if you're immunizing someone who's already hospitalized lead to prolongation of their hospitalization or um, lead to death as well as we're also interested in um, events that are reported as life-threatening but may not um, necessarily have a, a hospitalization. For example, if someone has a potential allergic or anaphylactic reaction in the clinic and refuses to go to hospital, we'd be, be getting that sort of report. So in terms of severity, that's what we look at. And then we look at signals. So we look for um, events that are beyond what we would normally expect. Anaphylaxis is a bit of a, a different one because if you're having this sort of reaction immediately after the vaccine, it's probably related to the vaccine unless you were also exposed to something else at the same time. But then some of the other events that we get reports of after vaccination, like neurological um, events, like a, a, an onset of paralysis a few days after, or a few weeks after the vaccine, well, was that due to the vaccine? 
or we know that there are other reasons that paralysis happens. So we'd look at the number of events that we see after the vaccine to your expected number of events that you'd see in the in the general population for the same sort of time period to see, are we seeing more following vaccine that we would expect to see generally happening um, with COVID vaccines because we're prioritizing people in long-term care homes who are often unwell and have multiple medical conditions. Um, this is really important to keep in mind that we need to look at background rates and ideally look at them for um, people in that particular age group and in long-term care homes where people may be um, less healthy than those who are, are at that age still living out, out in the, the general population because we are going to be seeing more of these events happen sort of in our in our baseline levels just because of the population that we are dealing with so um, this is something that we need to to keep in mind when we are looking at our numbers of re reports coming in um, and looking to identify is there a signal or is this just something normal that would happen uh, regardless of whether someone had been vaccinated great well, thank you all. Um, this has been a very interesting panel, and uh, I'm sure that there's many more questions, but unfortunately, that's what we're going to have to call it for today. Um, so uh, thank you for those who have to pop off, and um, I'll invite those speakers um, for the next panel to um, turn your, your cameras uh, on. And so for this next part of the webinar, we'll be talking about low dead volume syringes. Um, again, one of our panelists will be uh, Dr. Brian Wachowski, who will be joined by Sean Meredith, who is a Lieutenant Colonel with Canadian Armed Forces. He's a lead medical planner as part of the COVID-19 Vaccine Rollout Task Force. Um, joining him are also um, Pascal St. Louis, who is a Senior Nurse Advisor with FAC, and Dr. Ko Pham, who is uh, the Executive Director of the Center for Regulatory Excellence, Statistics and Trials um, at Health Canada. So um, I think they have a short presentation, which they'll go over, um, and then we'll head into the Q&A. Thanks, April. Um, okay, so I'm just going to start off by just giving a bit of an overview of why we're discussing this topic, and then um, we'll turn it over to Pascal and to Sean as well. So uh, next slide, please. So as you uh, likely know from the media, um, as of yesterday, Health Canada has authorized a change in the number of doses per vial for the Pfizer-BioNTech product. So originally it was five doses per vial, and now the, the product monograph indicates six doses per vial. This is based on the fact that um, we know that the volume of the vaccine in the vial when you first get it is 0.45 mils. And then we know that we add 1.8 mils of normal saline diluent, uh, diluent sorry. And so between those two, um, the math comes to 2.25 uh, milliliters of liquid product in the vaccine vial. And we know that the dose of the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine is 0.3 mils. So um, with the 2.25 mil, uh, volume in the vial, it should be possible to um, withdraw six doses. We do know, though, that there is some extra volume that's not accounted for in that math, and that's some of the, uh, the liquid that remains or is drawn up into the needle and syringe, um, which isn't counted in the 0.3 mils. And we do know that there's also um, not error, but variability in how people draw up um, both the diluent and the doses of vaccine. So it's not a guarantee necessarily um, and requires a bit of um, care and attention to ensure that we will be able to get the sixth dose um, from each of the vials. So it's dependent on making sure that, in fact, 1.8 mils of diluent is, is added and that each dose is 0.3 mils. Um, that little vaccine is left in the injection equipment, so you don't draw up anything that, that the equipment that we're using draws up very little that ends up being left in the injection equipment, and that we're drawing up very carefully, so we're being careful to be sure to get um, get all those doses and, and not to waste anything in the drawing up process. Um, so now I'll just speak to those um, three elements in just a bit more detail on the next slide. So the first element, as mentioned, is to make sure that the diluent is added at um, 1.8 mils and that each dose is 0.3 mils. And one of the ways to help 
get a 0.3 mil dose um, with more accuracy is to use a one mil syringe. So we know that um, the ability to get the sixth dose increases as we use that one mil syringe because we get uh, more accuracy in actually being able to see that 0.3 mil in the gradations on the syringe. The other um, mechanism to help ensure that um, we're able to con consistently get the sixth dose is um, using what we call low dead volume syringes or needles. And this is equipment that um, leaves um, very little volume of liquid in the syringe and needle. So it doesn't draw up um, extra, very much extra into the syringe or needle. And then when you um, expel the vaccine or give the vaccine, there's very little left in the, the syringe and needle. And so this has been a very important part of um, helping us to ensure that we can achieve that sixth dose from the uh, Pfizer-BioNTech vials. And the Public Health Agency of Canada has been in the process of securing um, as much supply as possible of these low dead space syringes and have secured sufficient supply um, to meet the needs that, that we will have uh, currently and going forward. And of course, the other um, piece to making sure that we can um, consistently as much as possible get the sixth dose is to um, is the technique of, by the user. And here there are some like, sil simple tricks that we've been talking about all along, like uh, when you draw up the vaccine and you have to express some air or adjust the dose, making sure that the needle remains in the vial. So any um, vaccine that's, um, that you express back out of the syringe goes and the needle goes back into the vial. And we've also been told um, from uh, experienced people that having one person at the clinic be the consistent person to be doing the dilution and also being to doing the drawing up process. They develop, um, you know, some expertise in that and, and that helps as well in terms of um, achieving that sixth dose from the vial. So I'll now turn it over to Pascal to talk a bit about the, the concept of low dead volume uh, needles and syringes. Great, thanks, Brenna. Um, we can just switch to the next slide here. Great, so uh, I guess to give uh, the gist of what a low dead volume syringe is, um, either a low dead volume or a low dead space syringe uh, refers to the amount of volume that remains within the syringe after administration has occurred. So in the picture you see on the screen, the picture on the left shows a higher amount of wastage or fluid remaining in the, in the syringe that's kind of noted by the dark gray dead space. And in the picture on the far right, it shows a syringe that's designed for, uh, to minimize wastage, which you can see from a redu reduction in the amount of gray space left in that syringe. While there's no current industry standard which clearly defines what a low dead volume syringe is, there's an understanding that there's an inherent benefit um, in this context to minimize wastage uh, in the syringe to try and optimize the doses that can be pulled from the vaccine vial. So all this to say, as a healthcare provider or um, the one drawing up either the vaccination or administering, administering it, what you'll typically notice in a low dead volume syringe is that um, the syringe body is, is usually looks the same. It's the plunger inside the syringe that is often extended into the neck of the syringe body to expel more of that fluid and thereby minimizing the waste and optimizing the vaccine administration. Important to note though that a low dead volume syringe is not mandatory for the administration of a vaccine. It really is to optimize um, getting you know, every single ounce of, of that vial out into a, a dose that can be administered. And so in the absence of a low dead volume syringe, you can use just a regular one mil or three mil syringe. And uh, you know, having a low dead volume should not be what delays the administration of any vaccine. Um, so now I'll turn it over to Sean just to go through uh, the last part of our presentation. Uh, thank you, Pascal. Next slide, please. So I'll kind of take it from the theoretical, as Pascal was talking about, into the, into the concrete and the practical aspect here. And I'll briefly discuss how to determine whether the syringes and needles you have are actually low dead volume. And I will sort of pile on here a bit to what Pascal has said, is that uh, the notion of a low dead volume or low dead space syringe is not, uh, does not exist within any manufacturing standards in that uh, in accordance with international manufacturing standards, the syringe and needle will pass uh, the QA, QC process if the dead space is less than 70 microliters or 0 0.07 mils. And I will add that it's undeniable fact that the smaller the dead space there is in a needle or syringe, 
the less volume that's actually caught up in that needle and syringe and the more that's available to be administered to patients. And I know there's been a lot of questions related to dead space and our federal, provincial, territorial partners are, are asking me on a routine basis, they're sending me pictures of their needles and syringes and saying, hey, Sean, is this a low dead volume syringe? And unfortunately, there are numerous manufacturers with numerous different product lines. So I can't definitively answer that question for folks. So what I'd like to do here is actually propose two possible solutions for you. Um, the first one is to sort of review any literature um, that the manufacturer may have um, or actually reach out to them and ask them what the dead space or dead volume is within their, uh, within their needles and syringes. And for those that uh, know me well, know that I'm very cynical and I really don't believe what a lot of people have to say. And so there's actually a way in which you can derive the results uh, by yourself. And I'll sort of go over that very, very quickly here. So the second um, option that you can do here is by following ISO 7886 part one. Uh, this is the international standard for sterile hypodermic syringes for single use, syringes for manual use. It's very difficult to say. Annex C of the standard uh, lays out the procedure to determine what the dead space is in a syringe. Now you have to pay for the standard. And so I can't actually put up on the screen, uh, particularly what has to be done. However, I can speak to it in very general terms. And it's important to realize here as well that we're talking about some very, very small volumes. And so if you are gonna conduct these tests locally, you know, make sure it's done by some bench scientists with the appropriate skill level and have the appropriate equipment to be able to uh, conduct, this, uh, conduct this task. And sort of what I say is I have, a, I have a, a scale that I use to measure out my espresso grinds in the morning that's accurate down to uh, 0.1 grams that's insufficient to be able to conduct this type of test. But as per the uh, cartoon here, we'll go briefly over how to determine uh, the dead volume space in your, uh, in your syringe. So the first step here is to weigh the empty syringe. Then what you're gonna do is you're gonna fill up that uh, syringe to the nominal capacity with distilled water. You wanna make sure that you remove any bubbles from the syringe. And going back to our grade six science here, making sure that the meniscus or the bottom of that, um, uh, you know, what you've measured out is actually on the line of that uh, full nominal volume of that syringe. The next stage is to completely expel all the liquid from your syringe. And then the last step is to weigh it. And so the difference between the reweighed re -weighed syringe and the empty syringe from the beginning is what is caught up in the dead space of that syringe. And keeping in mind that one milligram of distilled water is equal to one microliter. So if you notice that there's a 70 uh, milligram difference between the two syringes, that means the dead space in your syringe and needle is 0 0.07 mils or 70 microliters. So that's all that I have today and uh, we'll be standing by for any questions, thank you. Great, thank you to the panelists. Um, that was a really great overview of the issue. And we have um, additional uh, comments coming in from the Q&A. Uh, so the first question is, uh, given the difficulty in obtaining the six doses and the uncertainty of the supply of low dose volume syringes, um, <clears throat> excuse me, there will be cases where obtaining six doses will not be possible. Um, What, what uh, do you recommend um, with respect to um, using the supply of syringes that you have on hand? If I could just start with that and then uh, Pascal, maybe you could jump in as well. Or um, So just, I just want to reaffirm that the Public Health Agency of Canada has been through Pascal's very hard work and her team procuring tons and tons of um, low dead volume syringes. So those should be making their way out to you and Pascal can go into a bit more detail. If you don't have a low dead volume syringe and you're using the Pfizer BioNTech vaccine, then the next best thing is a one mil syringe. Um, you, you know, it's, you're not as likely to get the six dose consistently. Um, and if you don't have that, obviously, as was mentioned in Pascal's presentation, um, then use the three mil. So Pascal, do you want to add uh, more details on, on the procurement issues? and 
Sure, yeah, absolutely. And I mean, I think it's important to note that the low dead volume is really there to try and optimize to try and get the six dose. It's not always a guarantee. And so um, I think, you know, nobody wants to preclude anybody from getting a vaccine just because that syringe isn't available at your vaccination center. That being said, at the federal level, uh, we have procured uh, signif a, a significant amount of low dead volume syringes, enough to meet the needs of the vaccine rollout. And we continue to assess other um, as well as um, new products come online. We do also conduct uh, testing, quality assurance testing on those syringes, and we do conduct testing uh, in collaboration with the um, NRC to uh, validate that they are in fact low dead volume and can meet the needs uh, stipulated by the vaccine suppliers. And Pascal, to, to, to correct me if I'm wrong, it's, it may, may not be the Public Health Agency of Canada that you're that's uh, doing the procurement. It's it's actually Health Canada. Is that correct? Or no, it is uh, the Public Health Agency of Canada. Oh, okay. Um, so these okay. syringes are being procured uh, via the National Emergency Strategic Stockpile and then allocated to uh, provinces and territories. And subsequently, I'm sure they are allocating uh, to make sure it's getting to all of the uh, points of administration. Okay. Great. Thanks. And, and can I just add one, one more thing to that? Just um, the, the information that Sean provided to you is, um, is so that you understand and have those, that capacity, but it's not, you don't have to do the, that testing on your own. You, you will know that the, the syringes that have come from the Public Health Agency of Canada will have gone through that testing and verified that those are um, low dead volume syringes. Great, thank you. Um, the next uh, question is about uh, a best practice um, guideline, I think from uh, CARNA, um, saying that the person that draws up the dose should give the, vac the vaccine. And the best practice um, is uh, that the person that dilutes the vial is the one that should give all the doses. Um, and so uh, thinking through a little bit about um, uh, one person being set to, to draw up all the, the doses dependably, uh, maybe you could give your, your advice about the best practice uh, for, for the low dose volume syringes. Yeah, um, so there's, you know, different um, ideas about how um, best practice works and in immunization clinics where there's, um, you know, large volumes of people being vaccinated, it is not, um, and not, like it's, it's a common practice for um, people to have different people doing different functions. Now that may not be um, considered best practice in some settings, but in immunization clinics, it's fairly standard practice. Not everybody does it this way, but it is um, you know, considered acceptable practice to have different people doing different functions. So having somebody you potentially um, being uniquely the person who does the dilution, then that person or someone else uniquely doing the, the drawing up practices and then other people doing the immunizations. There are some risks to that, um, that process, particularly, um, you know, you don't want to confuse products and you want to make sure it's done correctly. But generally in immunization clinics, it's felt to be a safe practice because you're really just doing one vaccine at one dose with one lot and there's no real risk of confusion. And in some ways, um, it makes it a lot safer because the immunizer has to focus on only one thing. They have to, they obviously, the immunizer has to check the volume in the syringe that they receive. Um, and, and administer that, but they don't have to go through this multi-step process, which in itself can be prone to errors. So yes, there is different standards and recommendations depending on your settings, but generally acceptable practice in mass or large immunization clinics to divide up those tasks, particularly when it's one product with one dose and one lot. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. Um, we have a question here. Can we use insulin syringes, even though we can't change the needle after drawing up the vaccine. Right, do you want me to tackle that? Um, I think the, sure. the challenge with the insulin syringes is typically the needle length is not long enough uh, or not uh, appropriate for uh, the administration of vaccine. And so those have not you know, typically been advocated for. Yeah. And just to reinforce, like the needle length for an IM injection is a one inch um, I should know it in centimeters, but it's one inch. And then if it's um, yeah. if the person 
cuts off at a certain um, weight, uh, larger than a certain weight criteria, then you can switch to a one and a half inch uh, needle. So as you said, Pascal, it would be too short on an insulin syringe. Yeah, those are more suited for subcutaneous injection. And so um, it wouldn't be ideal for the administration of uh, IM uh, vaccines. Great, thank you. Uh, our next question I think is for um, Ko. Uh, can you please elaborate more about the change from five doses to six doses per vial? Um, what will have changed? That's a great question. Um, and so from a regulatory standpoint, uh, when uh, Pfizer BioNTech made a global change in trying to access or extricate uh, uh, or extract, pardon me, from the vial, uh, a six dose, uh, there had been no change in the vial format or the volume in the vial. It was just recognized that there was uh, always an additional amount of overfill that was in there. And given the fact that uh, this is a precious commodity that we don't want to waste, uh, it was discovered in practice throughout uh, you know, vaccination campaigns around the world uh, that individuals were able to get a six dose out of that remaining or extra overfill quantity. And so it was then submitted from a regulatory perspective to say, well, we don't want to waste that overfill and see if we can extract that six dose. Um, a submission was provided uh, where that extra overfill could be then used um, as a six dose uh, with the proper equipment. Uh, and so this is not uncommon, by the way, for precious commodities not to be wasted and the proper equipment and technique to be applied. And I think in this context here, it would be very logical or reasonable. Uh, and a submission was made. In that submission, I might add that there was also validation studies to be done. And so three studies were submitted to Health Canada and validate uh, the type of um, low dose, uh, uh, pardon me, uh, low dead volume uh, syringes uh, and the type that uh, was uh, considered more standard and a comparison done. And indeed, if you were to use uh, low dead volume syringes uh, or ultra low dead volume syringes, you could extract uh, a six dose uh, with in fact good technique have a little bit of overfill remaining. And so that was the regulatory submission uh, and that's how it became uh, approved. Uh, and as such globally, uh, to be able to extract a sixth dose uh, of what is already in that vial uh, as being a precious commodity for us today. Hopefully that answers the question. Thank you. So that's great. Um, and actually there's a, there's a follow-up question. Um, will the labeling of the vaccine be changing from the, the five dose vial to the six dose trial uh, vial, I'm sorry. And will uh, any reporting be required if only five do doses are able to be removed from, from the vial? Yeah, so that two-part question, let me take on the first one. Absolutely, all labeling will need to be changed. And so that was part of the regulatory submission by Pfizer as well. So you'll see that on the vial itself, on the physical vial and physical carton of the product, uh, that it will now say six doses per vial. Um, you'll see that change on the product monograph. Uh, there will also be a um, uh, health product uh, uh, communication done on that to indicate uh, of the label changes as well as of the six dose change on there. So everybody will be very clear in terms of that vial now has six doses in it. The second part of the question is something that we would always want to have reported, not only from Health Canada's perspective, for public health as well. Uh, even in the old, old format of recommending five doses in that vial, if you were unable to extract five doses for whatever reason, we would have wanted to know about that. And so in this case here as well, if you're unable to um, extract six doses out of this, we would like to know about that as well. In particular, uh, if indeed you're using uh, the low uh, dead volume type syringes or ultra low dead volume type syringes and you're using proper technique and are unable to um, extract that six dose, it, it should be reported for sure. Thanks. Great, thank you. Um, and uh, there, there was a, uh, another question related to this was um, about potentially a, a vial or a dose number change for the Moderna vaccine. And um, I'm not sure if you're able to comment on that, but, but that was one of the questions. Yeah, 
You know, uh, I think that uh, in the public sphere, I'm not sure how much is out there, but Moderna is um, considering a vial, for, uh, vial format change uh, with an increased volume. We haven't seen that submission come in yet, um, but of course we would be looking at uh, it in the same sort of um, context that we have looked at with Pfizer. So if there's a vial format change with an increased volume and an ability to extract from a multi-dose vial uh, a larger amount of dose, it would have to be consistent with what that volume is and uh, the per dose uh, volume in the syringe that would be needed and to validate that that can occur within a practical sort of uh, ability uh, to get those multi-doses out of the multi-dose vial format that they would be proposing. Um, I can't speak more until we see that kind of submission, but I think that that is what we're hearing from the global space that they would like to be able to consider that. And of course that application or submission would come into Health Canada when those changes happen. Great, thank you so much for that context. Um, I think the next question may be for Sean, but please everyone feel free to jump in. Um, uh, someone writes, uh, we found it helps to make sure not to add 0.3 mils of air every time you go to withdraw a dose. Um, as that creates bubbles. Um, and their suggestion is to make sure to pull back the full 1.8 mils of air after combining saline. And this person is, is hoping for feedback on that uh, uh, procedure. I think I'll actually defer to our nurse on this one. Um, and then also just sort of keeping in mind that these um, you know, low dead volume syringes don't exist in manufacturing standards and that these low dead volume syringes just increase the likelihood of being able to extract sort of more doses from the vials. But I will turn it over to Pascal to answer that question. I think she's better positioned. Yeah, and I may leverage Brian on this one too. Um, but uh, yeah, I think it, with regards to this one, um, I would just suggest that we continue to uh, use the best practice guidelines for the administration and drawing up of any product. I mean, it is interesting to hear that um, that that does reduce kind of the, I guess, uh, bubble um, bubble creation by, by doing it this way. Um, but I think we would still continue to advocate to, to follow best practice guidelines. Uh, it, it was Brian, I just, the only time, time, if I can remember the process correctly, the only time that the, there's a notion of this error is that I think the manufacturer recommends that once you've added the diluent, um, to the vial, because you're adding volume and pressure to the vial, you, you increase the pressure in the vial. So there they recommend that you pull, after you've added the diluent, you pull out of the vial and you pull back 1.8 mils of air to equalize the pressure that you, from the extra volume you've added. But that's the only uh, mention of, you know, air within the process. Okay, that makes sense. Um, thank you, thank you for all of that. Um, we have a question about uh, supply and um, manufacture of LDB syringes. So um, when will the supply of LDB syringes, LDV syringes be available? And um, what manufacture, who are the manufacturers of these um, LDB syringes? Well, there are many manufacturers that uh, do have low volume, low dead volume, I guess, compliant uh, syringes. So some of them really vary in terms of what the amount of wastage is. So there's a large variety of, of manufacturers who um, do have compliant syringes. That being said, I'm sure everybody on this call can appreciate that it's competitive market out there for um, these types of needles and syringes at, at the global level. So um, at this time, the public health agency has contracts with two suppliers for these um, syringes. And uh, so one is Stevens and the other one is Maverin. They're both the distributors who are procuring from uh, you know, other manufacturers, which I don't have the actual um, names of those as of right now. Um, Distribution has already started to occur for some of those uh, low dead volume syringes, and we continue to receive additional shipments. And uh, we're we're doing our best to make sure they can quickly turn around from uh, you know our warehouses and out to provinces and territories, so they can further distribute. Great, 
Great. Thank you. Um, maybe we have time for, for these two quick questions. Um, one is about um, uh, the lure lock uh, for, I guess it has the needle um, attaching to the, um, the syringe part. Um, will, will these um, LDV syringes have a lure lock? Yes, so all the syringes procured um, at the federal level are all with a lure lock rather than the lure slit. My assumption was that the lure lock would minimize any type of leakage and therefore uh, be more easily secured. Um, and so uh, all of our syringes thus far have that. Great, thank you. And um, one more question, how do we report not drawing up um, six doses? From, from a vial. Um, it's Brent, I can, I can start with that. Um, so we're working on processes with the provinces and territories um, with regard to how that will be done. So um, put, stay tuned to your local jurisdictions um, recommendations on how best to keep track of that. Great. Um, and sorry, one more coming in here. Are low weight syringes usually attached um, to the needle or are there separate syringes to which a safety engineered needle could be attached to avoid uh, a needle stick injuries? So um, I guess it was always two ways. There are some needles and syringe combinations that exist uh, that we have not procured as of this point. Um, all of our syringes and needles that we have procured have been two separate entities. And then based on the jurisdictional requirements, we would send uh, the safety engineered needles um, based on you know, the legislative requirements of each jurisdiction. Um, but our low dead volume syringes that we've procured are lure law capable. So you have know, um, a separate needle to those syringes. And April, can I just add one thing to the response I gave before Please. in terms of reporting? Um, so the other thing that you can do is report directly to the manufacturer, because as was mentioned, the manufacturer um, is, is also monitoring this. So if, if you're not getting the sixth dose and if you don't know the, um, the provincial or territorial, uh, well, the provincial at this point, um, process, then you can report directly to the manufacturer as well. Great, that's good to know. Um, and I think that brings us to time. Uh, so thank you all so much for this uh, really great um, Q&A and, and panel discussion. And, um, and thanking all of the audience members for their um, participation through this webinar. Um, more information on additional webinars will be available. Um, please check nccid.ca for, for more information. And thank you to our wonderful hosts at NCCID. This has been uh, a really great discussion and we look forward to more in the future. Have a good day.